Gone Fishing, Part 1, The Fire Gail Manny's childhood memories aren't all that happy. Her clothes are homemade or hand-me-downs. She's self-conscious about her red hair and her freckles. At home, there's poverty and violence. At school, there's teasing. Still, she and the neighbourhood kids know how to make their own fun. They play tiggy and bull rush and softball in the nearby reserve. They build huts in the bush. They swim in the creek, even though everyone says it's polluted. Her best friends are the Wilson twins, Tanya and Tracy. They live a few doors down and are in the same class at Glen Dean Primary School. One day, when they're all about six years old, the twins find a box of matches. They tell Gail they have a stove in the bush. They're going to cook potatoes. Gail is looking after her baby brother, Colin. She's pushing him about in his stroller. But cooking sounds fun, so they all head into the bush to play with fire. Of course, the potatoes never get cooked. Instead, the girls set fire to the bush, and as the flames catch hold, Gail runs to fetch her mum, leaving her baby brother behind. Colin is rescued by Gail's older sister, and the fire doesn't spread far. But the next day, as the whole class sits on the mat, the teacher gives the twins a serious telling off. Gail is terrified, sure that her part in the bushfire will be discovered. In fact, the twins try to tell on her, but she's saved by their six-year-old lisps. When they say, Gail was there, it comes out as Dale. And by chance, there's a boy called Dale in the class, so he gets into trouble instead. And Gail just sits there, legs crossed, heart pounding, mouth shut. Her friendship with the twins is unaffected by all this, though, and she stays close to Tanya especially for years to come. That is, until Tanya points the finger at Gail, once again. From Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing, a podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Okay, um, unlawfully getting into a motor vehicle, DIC, um, driving while disqualified, um, shoplifting, prostitution, um, disorderly behaviour, um, and there might be a couple of common assault charges in there as well. I'm Amy Moss. I first met Gail Maney in prison. She was the leader of a team in the kitchen who catered for outside events. So pies, sandwiches, slices, that sort of thing, would be loaded onto trolleys and taken to conferences or meetings. I doubt the people there knew their food was being made by prisoners. Gail and I were chatting about the story I was working on when she told me she would be out soon. One of her first goals once free was to write a cookbook of her prison recipes. Later, when I asked a prison warden what Gail was in for, she kind of rolled her eyes and told me people didn't end up in prison for doing nice things. Then she leaned in and actually whispered the word, murder. Gail was paroled not long after, but it took me about a month or so to track her down. It was tricky. She'd been in prison so long she had no digital footprint, no Facebook, nothing on the electoral roll. The only addresses I could find were for places she wasn't allowed to visit. Eventually, I found a comment on a blog which led me to a person who gave me her cell phone number. I rang Gail up and asked her if she would talk to me about her cookbook. She paused. No, she said. But do you want to talk about the murder? That's how Amy met Gail. I didn't hear about her story until about a year later, and I didn't meet Gail herself for another few months after that. But when Amy started talking to me about Gail Maney, I saw why she'd become a bit obsessed. She was thinking about Gail's case 24-7 and working on it evenings and weekends. Soon, I was drawn in too. And when both of us went back to Gail to start recording podcast interviews, this is the story Gail told us. April 1997. Gail is 30, has three kids, and lives in the Auckland suburb of Blockhouse Bay. One morning, 
She's sitting in the kitchen at the table, we'll having, having a, a coffee, coffee with my flatmate Daryl. Um, there was a knock at the door, so I got up and went into the hallway, and then the um, front door runs off the hallway. And I think I looked first to see who was there, and I thought it was the police. So um, quickly told my flatmate, it's the police, you know, or maybe I said it's the pigs. <laughs> um, so of course we ran around hiding um, probably like a bit of marijuana and um, that would have been illegal. But we were in like panic mode before I opened the door. Um, yeah, and then it was, then they were standing there and I was thinking, oh gosh, what do they want? Because um, they were detectives. What they want is to ask Gail about something she might have seen nine years earlier, in 1989. Back then, Gail was 22 years old and sharing a rented house in Henderson, a working class suburb in West Auckland. The house was in Larnack Road. Through 1989, Gail had various flatmates, but the one you'll want to remember is her old school friend, Tanya Wilson. But standing on her doorstep in 1997, Gail isn't interested in a trip down memory lane with the cops. Aside from the cannabis in the house, she also has opium cooking on the stove. Gail has recently learned how to bleed poppy heads, extract the sap, and boil it up to make a potent homemade narcotic. There is no way she's letting the cops in the door. Um, so I was feeling quite nervous because um, I was, you know, like the lifestyle that I lived. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then that's when they said that they wanted to talk to me um, and would like me to come to the police station with them, but they wouldn't um, tell me what it was about. They wouldn't give me any indication, any indication, any hint. Um, and of course, I didn't. Tr I don't trust the police, so I was a bit hesitant to go with them, thinking this is going to be a trick. They're going to get me in the car and take me down there and arrest me for something. Um, but after a bad-tempered half hour on the doorstep, Gail goes to the station. And then they came into the room and they said to me that they had um, information to say that Stephen Stone had been had killed someone um, and they wanted me to help them put him in prison. Stephen Stone. We'll hear a lot more about him later, but for now, all you need to know is that for a short time back in 1989, he was a regular visitor to Gail's house on Larnock Road. The detectives tell Gail they have reason to believe that back then, Stephen Stone and an associate killed a man somewhere in the bush. They then put the body in the boot of their car and took it to Gail's house in Larnock Road. There, they showed it off to several people. The cops say Tanya Wilson has been talking to them about the body. They say Tanya says Gail was there too. Tell us about the body in the boot, they say to Gail. Help us put Stephen Stone behind bars. He said to me that if I would help them, like Tanya was, that they would give me and my family um, a new, how did he word it, it was like a, a better life anyway, a, a, better, a new identity and a better life, um, somewhere else to live and things like that if I would help them. But I, I just was like, this is just bizarre, this is just absolutely crazy, you know, I don't know of, a, of Stephen Stone ever doing a murder, um, we've never seen any body, um, we don't have any knowledge of anything like that, and what Tanya could In fact, was Gail to does know something like about a body in the boot of a car. But she says it was just a prank Stephen Stone played on them once. He turned up at Larnock Road and announced he had a body in the boot, just to give everyone a scare. But then he laughed and said he was only joking. Gail says when Tanya Wilson was a bit drunk, she'd sometimes retell and embellish and exaggerate that story. Tanya Wilson even made out that she'd seen the body with her own eyes. Somehow, Gail thinks, Stephen Stone's joke has grown in the telling. Now someone has told the cops about it, and the cops are pressuring the old Larnock Road crowd for information. I said, what Tanya is telling you is not true. Um, and I was like, this is just a lie, and I've got nothing to say, you know, so take me home. <laughs> um, they take her home, but they're not done with her yet. They start turning up to her house every day. Knocking on my door and asking to talk to me, and I just was refused to go with them again and said, unless you've got something, unless you're arresting me, then I've got nothing to say to you, and I would just slam the door in their face. So then the police even went as far as when I following me to pick my children up from school, um, and then pulling me over in front of, like, the, with all the other parents and school kids and things like that and then actually saying in front of my children you know like what do you know about a body and um, asking me about a murder in front of my children which is pretty like um, intense. I guess it was just all about like these are my rights and um, I don't have to speak to you if I don't want to but I guess that you know like I've done things in my life where I've um, had an antisocial lifestyle where I've 
been involved in criminal activities or drugs and things like that. So when you're in that kind of world, you know, you talk about the police and how you're anti them and, you know, you don't talk to the police unless you have to. And So it was just that kind of um, mentality, which wasn't helpful, you know, for me in the, at the end of the day. <laughs> but it wasn't because I had anything to hide. Tuesday at 8.30 on Television One. Crime Watch, helping the police solve crime, robbery, homicide, assault. Gail stonewalls, but the investigation gathers pace. Police appeal to the public for information through the Crime Watch TV programme, and they keep piling the pressure on Gail. There's a raid on her house. I'd taken my kids to school, and I came back, and I went to drive up the driveway, and I saw all the police cars in my driveway. So I took off up the road, and I was trying to ring my flatmate, and the police answered the phone and said that if I didn't come back right, they just saw me come to the drive, and if I didn't come back right now, they were going to shoot the dog because um, <laughs> we had a pit bull, um, so they are going to shoot the dog. So I came back, I was only around the corner, um, and they had a warrant to seize all personal documents to try and... A little later, in early July, Gail asks police if she can get back the documents and photos that were taken in the raid. The police tell her to come and pick them up from the station. So I went there, I can't even remember exactly what I was wearing. <laughs> I was wearing um, I had black tights on, a black fitted um, velvet mini dress and a purple crochet cardigan and um, I hadn't had my benzos that morning <laughs> so I wasn't feeling very good and I went there, they told me just to come upstairs and go into a room and then they just came in and said that you're under arrest and we're charging you for the murder of Dean Phyllis Andes and I was just thought whoa this is like freaky, like, I just couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I'd just taken my children to school, so. Now, Gail is, and this is where, where it all changes, she's much more than a witness. She's now at the very heart of the crime. They gave the scenario of events um, in which they said that he had um, sold me drugs and that then he'd come back and stolen the drugs off me, so I had ordered a hit on Dean Phyllis Andes and asked Stephen Stone to do the hit and that Stephen Stone had lured him to the bush and killed him. And then they put the body in the boot with Mark, and they had Mark Hendrickson and my brother, Colin, and then they brought the body back to Larnock Road and showed the body to me and Tanya. And then they said, they, then they said that Stephen Stone went and got rid of the body. So that was scenario one. Yep, that's scenario one. It won't be the last. To the murder of Dean Fuller Sandys. Our reporter covering the case at the Henderson District Court is Kitty Coughlin, and she joins us now. Well, the Crown prosecutors have outlined for the first time today what they and the police allege happened with the woman and three men who were charged with the murder of Dean Fuller Sands. They say that the woman whose house he used to visit with friends believed that he was responsible for the burglary of her house in early August 1989 and that she put out a contract on his life. They allege that one of her acquaintances agreed to carry Carry out the hit. And that the news report is from the 27th of January 1998, six months after Gail and three other people are arrested, nine years after the murder. Gail is on bail so she can look after her children, but the men, Stephen Stone, Stone's friend Mark Henriksen and Gail's little brother Colin are all in custody. This is a depositions hearing. A preliminary appearance at a district court where prosecutors demonstrate that they have enough evidence to take it all the way to a trial at the High Court. The defence lawyers are there too, and they can cross-examine the witnesses, just like an actual trial. These days, deposition hearings hardly ever happen. Crown prosecutors usually take the case straight to trial. But the reason we're so interested in this hearing is that it gives us a detailed account of the death of Dean Fuller Sands or, at least, the scenario that the police have at the time of the arrests, what Gail calls Scenario 1. The hearings are set down for three weeks. The court transcript runs to hundreds of pages. The prosecution, or Crown, call more than 40 witnesses out of the 200-odd people police have interviewed. There's the neighbour who says she saw the burglary at Larnock Road and told Gail about it. There's the man who says he saw Gail arguing with Dean Fuller Sands in the Westwood Ho Tavern. There are Dean Fuller Sands relatives, Gail's old landlord, a weather expert, and so on. But 
The heart of the police case is the statements of people close to Gail, people like Tanya Wilson, who gives a super detailed account of being alongside Gail almost every step of the way. Those items stolen in the burglary? That was Gail's weed and Tanya's leathers. The day when the neighbour told Gail she'd seen a burglar? Tanya was there. Gail's argument at the pub with Dean? Tanya and another friend who we're calling Sonia were at her side. The fatal moment when Gail told Stephen Stone she wanted Dean taken care of? Tanya overheard it. The day the men turned up with Dean's body in the boot and supposedly showed it to Gail at Lanark Road? Tanya and Sonia were there with her. Tanya's evidence runs to 65 pages. Without her account, and those of a few other people from the Larnock Road scene, the Crown case is dreadfully thin. So many of the normal things you need to put together a murder case are missing. For a start, there's no crime scene. It wasn't clear where the murder of Dean Phyllis Sands was meant to have happened. There's no forensics, no blood, no DNA, no murder weapon, no bullet casings, no fingerprints. There are no phone records or CCTV recordings. And most of all, no body. There is no body. Instead, the police have built the case by piecing together information from people who claim to have seen something or heard something or been told about something. Police have sifted through the many versions of events they've heard, trying to decide what's true and what's a lie. And even after this depositions hearing, there are plenty more lies to come. Because at its core, this is a story of truth and lies. And often, it all comes down to what you choose to believe. The man bringing all those pieces together is Detective Inspector Mark Franklin. He left the police more than a decade ago, but we found media reports suggesting he's living in the Cook Islands. We found what we believed was a home phone number for Franklin in Rarotonga. But... Um, he's been deported back to New Zealand. Oh, OK, right. Um, and yeah. you, you don't have any contact details for him? Um, no, no, we don't, sorry. OK, so Mark Franklin appears to be back in New Zealand. We try the white pages. Speaking. Hi, um, Mark, are you um, by any chance a former police officer? No. No. <laughs> and you don't know a Mark Franklin who used to be a police officer by any chance? Um, I'm actually a corrections officer. Oh, OK. <laughs> but Mark Frank- there was a Mark Franklin that was a detective. Yeah, it's him that we're trying to track down. Years ago. Yeah. Um, I think he got locked up. I think he went bad. Yeah, I think he. I think he may have. Yeah, I think he went overseas yeah. to some other country and was doing some shady deals or something. But yeah, no, I've, I've never. I don't know him. He's, I don't think he's any relation or anything. But um, yeah, yeah, there was a detective Mark Franklin because I remember seeing it in the paper and I was thinking. Hopefully people don't think that's me. (laughs) Right. Clearly that's the wrong Mark Franklin. Still, he's right about his namesake's past. Back in the 1990s, Detective Inspector Mark Franklin used to be in the paper a lot because of his successful homicide investigations. But after he left the police, he got into a spot of bother in Rarotonga and served some prison time for minor cannabis offences. Anyway, after a few more phone calls and some Googling and, okay, a quick look on Facebook, we managed to find... Um, Mark, M-A-R-K, Franklin, F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N, um, currently self-employed. Mark Franklin is in his late 50s. He'd been a detective for more than 27 years before packing up and heading to Rarotonga. There, he did a bit of this and a bit of that and played in a band. He's a pretty good singer. He's picked up some gigs since returning to New Zealand. Amy and I got him on tape a couple of times, once at the house he was briefly living in when he returned, and then later in the RNZ studio, which explains the variable sound quality. I still dream of nightmares, but not about the gory stuff, but just the pressures of working in the police. So, no, I, I, I would never, ever even think about going back. Franklin led a bunch of murder cases, but the Dean Fuller Sands case always stood out. Every now and then I get into a conversation with someone and, and, and they ask me, if I'm in the mood to talk about a case, I will. And generally, if someone says to me, oh, what was your most interesting or fascinating, this is it. The, the first 
story I tell, really. It's not a run-of-the-mill homicide. It's quite unique in a lot of ways. It took a number of years because as the investigation grew, um, more people became named, more information was given, and it was a little bit like peeling the layers off an onion. Difficult investigation because there wasn't forensics, there wasn't bodies, there wasn't scenes, so we were dealing with evidence that was from uh, people and their credibility came into, into question. Franklin's understating things here. The entire case hangs on the credibility of some of these witnesses. It was quite intriguing how it started. It was simply a piece of information that was telephoned into the police communication centre and was passed on to me to investigate. So the whole investigation was based on one person giving us the names of another person who talked about a body in a boot. That's how it started. And that was most unusual because in my experience, um, most homicides start with a, a body and a scene. Um, and that's fairly straightforward because you've got a body and a scene to work from. In this case, we didn't have either of those. This is the tip-off that sets the wheels in motion. Scenario one starts here. That call to the police in 1997 was made by an Auckland panel beater, Dave Arnott. He was in a rocky relationship with Tanya Wilson. Remember, that's Gail's old friend. After one fight that got physical, Tanya went to the police. Dave Arnott picked up the phone and offered the cops some information about Tanya in return. According to Dave Arnott, Tanya would sometimes talk about the time, a few years earlier, when she had seen the body of a man in the boot of a car at Gail's Larnock Road house. It sounds crazy. Something out of a crime novel, not suburban Auckland. Who drives round with a dead body in the boot of their car? But it's the sort of tip Franklin could hardly ignore. So that was the start of it. It was Dave giving us some information about a conversation that he had uh, with Tanya Wilson. Um, and that conversation centred on a body in the boot. As we progressed and spoke to Tanya and... Um, it became immediately evident that there was something in what Dave said because Tanya made an acknowledgement. Although it was muddled, it was fairly solid in terms of identifying a number of people that were involved, that there was a body, that they put a body in a boot. So that's what we had to start with, was really a certain garbled version with but names of people, an address. But what we needed to know was, well, if there's a body, it's, it's got to be a missing person. We had a rough time frame, so our job at that point was to try and find out who that body was before we even went to these people. At that time, the police didn't have a National Missing Person Bureau. Basically, each police district was left up to their own records as to who was missing. Where. But regardless, we had a rough time frame. I think it was a, within a couple of months we were fairly sure that was when this alleged yeah. body had happened. That's all it was at that point, was an allegation. Mm -hmm. But we had to try and find out who it was. So we did a series of search warrants, started profiling the occupants of Larnock Road, who were their associates, who went to that address, who went to the parties, where are all the photographs, and slowly started building a picture of who was who in the zoo down there. The police cross-referenced this web of social connections against likely missing persons cases. Soon, they narrow down the likely candidates for the body in the boot to just four or five men who went missing around late 1989. And finally, they settle on just one name, Dean Fuller Sands. Now, they have a likely victim. They have some suspects. They have some witnesses, and some of those witnesses are starting to talk to them. The problem for Mark Franklin is that a lot of the time they're telling lies. What you've got to appreciate is that these were young people and it was a bit of a gangland type killing because there were gangsters involved, gang members, Stephen Stone obviously, a very influential gang member. It was prostitution, drugs. This was serious stuff back, back in those days. So people started to talk but they were limited in what they were saying. But eventually as these people spoke and we got the identity of Dean Fuller Sandys, we compile what I thought was sufficient evidence to um, consider charges. Now that's not my job to determine guilt, that's the job of a jury, 
My job was to investigate it to the best of my ability with the resources I had and then put that evidence to Crown Law for Crown Law to make a decision whether to prosecute. From what I had done, I, cons- I considered the, I, my recommendation was, yes, let's prosecute. But it wasn't my choice. The Crown could go ahead. So we had our first lot of depositions. And at that point, it was simply around the body in the boot. By the time of the arrests, there are two clear groups. There are the people who are talking and the people who aren't. And things aren't going all that well for the people who aren't. The difference was Stone and Gale and Mark Henriksen and Gail's younger brother said nothing. That was their legal right to say nothing, but I was asking myself why aren't they saying anything when these other people are clearly saying we've got something here. To be fair, I, everyone had the chance to give us their side of the story at, at the time. Some did, some didn't. The ones that did decide to cooperate eventually became witnesses, although clearly there had to be immunity issues, there was no assurance of that. They could have been charged because they were all implicating themselves deeply, but the end result is that those that cooperated ended up being witnesses, those that didn't cooperate ended up facing charges. So that's the situation in early 1998. As the Crown lays out the facts it plans to take to trial at the High Court. Tanya Wilson has told police that back in 1989 she saw a body in a boot. She says Gail Maney ordered a hit. She says Stephen Stone pulled the trigger and that Mark Henriksen and Gail's little brother Colin helped move the body. The police have found other witnesses whose statements seem to match the scenario and they conclude that the victim was a man called Dean Fuller Sands who went missing around that time. But Gail says she never ordered a hit on Dean Fuller Sands. She says she never even met Dean. In fact, she says Dean wasn't murdered at all. He'd simply gone fishing. Next time on Gone Fishing. As soon as you washed off that rock out there, you're out in the ocean and you sweat the way mines. He was definitely water savvy. He understood the dangers and risks of fishing off rocks neighbour who was the key witness, she was wrong. She was totally wrong. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Jeremy Veal and Rangi Poek. Visuals by Jason Dore. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe. Subscribe.